Today's episode has been brought to you by Offering Tree. New yoga teachers, I'm doing a free workshop for yoga teachers tomorrow if you're listening to this episode in real time. So that's September 27th. I'm going to be talking about all the things I wish I would have known in my early days as a yoga teacher. If you are not a new yoga teacher, you are still welcome to attend. There's stuff in here that it took me years to learn. This workshop is being hosted by Offering Tree. Yes, they sponsor the podcast. Yes, they're also the amazing all-in-one software that I use in my own business and that I'm telling yoga teachers about all the time. One note on that. Did you know that Offering Tree hosts free workshops for yoga teachers? This is super important in two ways. Make sure to get on their email list if you want to attend, but also if you have something that you want to share that would help yoga teachers, connect with them, attend some of the workshops that they offer, see how they're run, and then you might want to pitch your own topic idea at some point. I'll link to the workshop in the show notes for today's episode. And also as a podcast listener, if you decide to use Offering Tree, we have a discount code for you over at offeringtree.com slash Shannon. Oh, and one more note on that. If you're listening to this after September the 27th of 2022 and you want to access that workshop, let me know. I'll figure out how we can link to it or how I can talk to you more on the podcast about it. Hello and welcome. Let me start there. This is the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Crow. I use she, her pronouns. And this podcast is being recorded on Anishinaabe, Odawa, and Mississauga land, also called the Bruce Peninsula in Ontario, Canada. If you are new here, you might not know that I'm also a mom of three, a yoga teacher, podcaster, and founder of Pelvic Health Professionals. And this podcast was created for you so that each and every week you are connected to the information and inspiration that is going to support you as you build your yoga business. In today's episode, we're talking about better balance. No, Not work-life balance, although that's super important too. Today, we're talking about having better balance, which some of us may find challenging. We definitely hear that yoga students want to improve their balance if we've been a yoga teacher for any length of time. But this is also especially important for us and our yoga students as we age. And I am super excited that Susie Haightley is going to share her expertise on this topic with all of us today. Susie Haightley is the founder of Functional Synergy, and she helps people reveal and heal their human potential regardless of their age or condition. She also helps yoga teachers, yoga therapists, and healthcare providers hone their talent and become excellent practitioners. Susie loves teaching people, many of them over 50, some well over 60 and 70, how to get out of pain and handle a host of other symptoms like autoimmune flares, recovery from cancer treatment, and general life burnout. Susie combines both her formal training in kinesiology and her deep knowledge of yoga to foster the magic of recovery and healing so that people can live well with strength and ease and better balance. In our conversation today, you will learn how yoga helped Susie's father improve his balance and mobility, which inspired her to get into this line of work. She outlined some key components to balance. Apart from poses, where we're asked to stand on one leg in a yoga class, and the importance of asking students why they want to improve their balance. Susie also talks about joint mobility, rest, breath, and breathing, and how all of these things impact balance. And she also offers tips to help our students and ourselves maintain and improve balance as we get older. So next time a student comes to you and says, I want to improve my balance or my balance is terrible, or maybe you're working with an older population in your yoga classes, you are going to have this information in your back pocket. Thanks to Susie. Let's dive into this interview today. Welcome. 
welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast, Susie. It's so great to have you here today. Thank you. This is going to be a lot of fun. I'm really excited that we get to talk about balance and how to maintain our balance and help our students with that as they age. Uh, But before we get into that, tell our listeners, if they don't know who you are, what's the work that you do and who do you do it for? Great. So I am based in Calgary, Canada, and I've been working therapeutically with yoga um, for almost 30 years. And I work with a range of people with a variety of issues from knee replacements, hip surgery, getting older. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things I haven't, there's, there's, there's not many things I haven't worked with, but it's mostly that I'm using yoga therapeutically. And then I also train uh, healthcare professionals and other yoga teachers in therapeutic modalities so that they can utilize yoga therapeutically with their client base. And I've been on, I've been online since 2014, 2012 ish. And so this online realm has been my home for a long time. Right. You were ready to go. You weren't doing the scramble, uh, with 2020. So when you say that you're working online, does that mean with yoga students, with yoga teachers or both? Both. Yeah. So I work with more people out of Canada than I do in Canada. All right. So most of your, you mean yoga students or teachers or both? Both. Yeah, (laughs) both. So I work with a lot of people over in Europe, some down in the States. We've worked, we work as far over as Africa, Asia, down to Australia. So we, we, we cover, we cover a lot of the globe. Right. That's great. And so let's get into talking about balance and how yoga can help with balance and how we can help our students. First of all, um, when did you start getting excited about talking about balance? It was um, my dad. So my dad, he's no longer with us, but when he was 79, he started to take yoga and he did a basic restorative class that my husband and I took him to when we visited him in Toronto and we went with him and then we went up for breakfast after that and he was sort of moving his shoulders around and moving his head and he was the, you know a typical older guy not really aware but kind of aware and he's like wow this feels really good like there's no like pain and then he emailed me back like I'd already left to go back to Calgary he emailed me later in the week and said I had to go back I had to go back to this yoga thing and then as I saw him get better and progress in his movement and his capability. Um, I also saw how his balance got better as well. And we, and he kept practicing right through, um, uh, man, right through till, um, 88. And it was, um, yeah, it was, it was just remarkable. And when he didn't practice, I also saw the decline for him in his balance. So it just started to really see that so much change can happen at any age. And I already work with a lot of people who are older, but to see to see someone so close to me have that impact, it just, it just landed more in me of like, all right, people need to know that your age doesn't matter, that things can happen and change at any time. And balance is such an important construct, particularly, uh, particularly as we get older. I love this story. Uh, just so you know, my dad lives in Alberta and I'm here in Ontario. So it's the flip and he's turning 70 this year. And I'm thinking, could I get him to go to a yoga class? <laughs> was your, your dad was into doing yoga at 79. That feels like a, a late start. Well, the thing was, is what happened. So we, we took him to the class and of course he was willing. I'm his daughter. <laughs> it was after that though, that he's, that he was like, wow, like my legs felt 25 years younger. I had to go back. Wow. So it was like, it was like he was compelled to go back because he felt so good. And it was something that works so well that that's the kind of guy he was. If it's like something's working, he'll keep going after and doing it. And so he would go on his own. He would get into his car. Some might wonder why he drove at that age, but he got into his car and would, would go to the studio, which was about five blocks or six blocks away. And yeah, every week. That's amazing. Okay. So you really saw the improvement with his balance. So what is it about yoga that helps us to improve our balance? What do you think it is? Well, what's interesting about balance, and as I've dug into more about what balance is, I find that there's a gap actually in what we see yoga and other modalities. Like when you look at improve your balance, stand on one leg, 
do your tree post on one leg. And it's, it's, it's more than that. Like the, there's the key components are what's going on in your inner ear, your vestibular system, what's going on visually, as well as what's going on motor developmentally, like your motor control patterns and just neuromuscular, how your body moves. And so when you get these three working together, it can be really effective. So why yoga can be helpful is yes, we're staying on the one leg. Yoga can also be helpful from the perspective of moving better, breathing better. Rest is a huge component to, um, to better balance. Having your sense of awareness of what's going on around you, improving your proprioceptive ability, that's all what yoga can contribute to. And then there's ways that we, we like vestibularly, what that system does is it helps track our head movement in space. So when we're doing things in yoga where our the what's below our head is doing one thing and then our head is moving, doing another thing, that can actually help improve some of those components that contribute to balance if we are specific in doing them. So all of those things can contribute to, and, and I emphasize all of them because it's, it's more than just say on one foot, like, right. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's blending all of those pieces together. So if a yoga student comes to our class and they specifically put on their form or they tell us before class, I really want to improve my balance. Uh, what, what types of things would you put at the top of the list as you're working with someone? Well, the first step though, is to find out why, like, what is it about why they need to improve their balance so that you can be clear on what's contributing to their concerns about balance. So that would be like number one. And then if you're in a group class, and this is the tricky thing with groups, right? Because there's multi-levels and, um, and all those things associated with groups, but you could start off with doing shifting of weight, being aware of just where body parts are in space, because those pieces are necessary to improve balance. So starting with those basic pieces so that you can track what they're doing. Now, of course, in a group class, depending on the size, you might not be able to completely track what's going on for that person, but you could have them pay attention to when are they losing their balance or when do they feel a little bit uncomfortable in their balance or when do they feel their balance is improving. And then it's, so it's like, you're giving them the opportunity to, to track that so that they can measure it that as they go along, because of the inherent nature of what yoga is, they can, um, they can, they can see their progress or on the flip side, the lack thereof. So when you're, when you're doing this, shifting the weight, do you keep something nearby like the wall or a chair, or do you have anything when people are sort of fearful about their balance? You could. And again, it depends on the nature of the class. So if it's a, um, let's say it's a class that is with people who have a concern around balance or they're wanting. So when, uh, when I first started teaching yoga, I worked at a place in Calgary called the Kirby center, which is one of the seniors senior organizations in town. I think you have to be 55 to be a member. And I was teaching yoga to people in there that were mostly 65 and older. And all of them said, this is something that's winter coming up. We don't want to slip and fall. And so in that case, yes, we had chairs around because they also had other factors that were contributing to, um, to the possibility of losing balance. Like they were tighter in through their joints. They were they were, um, their feet were a little bit more limited, like in, in mobility, mobility, their breathing was not as deep as it could be as, as an example, their proprioceptive awareness was not as good as it could be. So we were working on all of those factors. And so part of that had them in a chair. So the chair was close by, we did use the wall. So you can use all of those, but again, it depends on the construct of the class that of like, if you've got a specific person who's in a, in a, um, multi-level class, then it might be saying, okay, let's all go to the wall or that person can go to the wall. But if you're in a group that's geared towards this type of practice of improving balance, like specifically, and they're over 65 or over 70, those props will be likely at hand. And then is there anything else? So we start with um, kind of shifting the weight from one leg to the other and trying that and working on that proprioception what other things do you love to share with students who want to work on balance? So another one would be feeling the bottoms of their feet on the ground. 
So center of the heel, ball of the foot, base of the pinky toe. And the reason I like the three points rather than a common cue of four is because those three points correspond to the arches of the feet. And most people can feel if they're kind of coming off that ball of the foot or not. And if they can't, if they aren't aware, it's also a place to begin. So they can feel that, that relationship of their movement. I would also have them notice that as they're doing that weight shift, as they're feeling their feet, what their breathing is like, and then connecting their ability to breathe with that foot in that balanced position. Um, and then really like simple hip mobility, spinal mobility, shoulder blade mobility, like those factors also play a big part in the coordination of those pieces play a big part in one's ability to balance. So as you're, as you're working through the positions, it's not just that weight transfer, but the overall mobility and function of how those joints work individually and then collectively. And we can do that in like how we're doing tree pose, for example, you can play with that weight shift, but also like, is the leg bone actually moving in the pelvis? Is, um, or is their pelvis moving and is their rib cage moving? Like if, and so teaching them really how to do that movement that, and then as they get the better hip function, they're going to find that their ability to be in space is that much more steady. That makes a lot of sense that the, it's definitely connected that hip mobility. I love how you brought that in as well. Is there anything that you wish, oh, like you just said the cue, which I've heard different ways, like four points of the foot when you're saying three, is there anything else that you think, ah, oh, this seems more helpful. I wish more teachers knew this thing about balance. Rest and breathing are important to balance. And I'm talking slowly through this because there, there are times when someone might be walking down the stairs or they see some ice and they kind of might hold their breath a little bit. And then they kind of like they're, and then so it's, it's almost as if they're, it's almost as their center of gravity kind of lifts a little bit and they're, they're braced up in there and they're not really in their legs anymore. They're not feeling their feet anymore. And then if we can help people learn how to relax and then feel their breathing, just feel their breathing again, then they, there tends to be this settling of their, of themselves. And then they can feel their feet and then trans, transfer through that, that ice, the better. So how that relates into the actual practice in yoga is to help people simply feel their breath as opposed to like doing something with their breath. We don't have to do anything with the breath necessarily. When it comes to balance, we just need to help them feel because so often when people are anticipating not being able to balance, they'll hold their breath. So if we can help them just breathe and just, that's it, just breathe and relax, you'll find that they hold their breath better. And it could even be like a cue for some people might be like, notice what's going on in the jaw or notice what's going on with the eyes, like depending on what the person is tuned into or aware of, and then utilize that as a, as a, as a cue for a person to connect. Oh, this is really good. I love how you said, explain that with the breath and, and that, um, anticipation. I, I worked at a physio office where we worked with people who had brain injuries. And of course, then the winter really um, can make people very fearful of walking. Also, you said rest. So I want to clarify, do you mean shavasana and yoga or sleeping well or a bit of both? Hey, Connected Yoga Teachers, I'm popping in here really quick to see if you noticed today, if you noticed a wording here uh, this was recorded before I talked with Indu and learned back in episode 288. Indu taught me to use the pronunciation Shavasan. So if you noted that because you're a regular podcast listener, you win two gold stars today. <laughs> okay, let's continue on. I just wanted to pop in and let you know and just say yes. Oh, I also wanted to tell you, in case you've been mulling this over, in case you've been like trying to say Shavasana instead of Shavasana, one person let me know that they said it was pronounced in different regions of India in different ways. So we're still learning about this. 
but I wanted to see if you noticed that. All right, let's see what Susie says about rest. It's a bit of both. So if we can take deliberate rest, that deliberate rest, because some people can sleep and not be rested. People can nap and not be rested. And so the key is, is how can we help a system downregulate and have a system become to that restful state? And then there's less of the, the, the anticipatory kind of vibratory sympathetic drive that can often be present for people if we can sort of settle and connect and be at ease we'll find that the balance is a lot better so is that then I mean for me I feel like I get that experience when I go to a yoga class you know you Mm -hmm. feel that down regulation you know what it feels like I know some people though who explain their symptoms outside of a yoga space, you know, a friend or family. And I think all you need is some down regulation of your nervous system. If you just (laughs) felt what that feels like, do you have any tips on, on, on uh, kind of guiding people there? Or do you have any things that you tell people when you're listening and you're thinking, yeah, yoga would help? You know, these days, I don't actually, and that might sound somewhat surprising, but over the years, I've learned that it's not my place to sort of try and convince someone to the practice of yoga. If someone is expressing some concern about something, there might be a conversation, but I don't typically guide anyone anywhere anymore. What, What might happen is someone might say to me, like, what are you, what do you do? Like, why is it that you're blah, 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 blah. And then I'll say, well, here's why. And then that might kind of get them interested. I had someone working with us, um, uh, who was our nanny for a, a series of months. And of course, then she found out what I did and all of that. And, and then she ended up starting to follow yoga with Adrian. So it's like, did I have an influence on her doing that? I don't know. Um, but maybe there was that influence, but we didn't ever had a conversation about, oh, you must go and do yoga, but something kind of tweaked for her. And then off she went and found the yoga that worked for her. So yeah, I don't actually do that so much anymore. Back in the day. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I would have, cause it's like, yes, everyone should do yoga, but I just don't, I don't do that so much anymore. Cause everyone's got their own pathway. Right. It's so true. I I so appreciate you saying that. Uh, That's exactly what I was thinking. Um, (laughs) You know, this person was asking me and then I was saying like, I really think yoga would probably help you to downregulate the nervous system and then left it at that. Like I'm not saying, hey, sign up for this yoga class. I've learned over the years. Uh, There's that saying of the expert, it lives more than 50 miles from your house or something like people are always looking for someone else (laughs) not looking in their backyard (laughs) yeah that's true yeah and so what about uh any homework do you send people home with homework okay try these things to improve balance well typically I do things that are super super easy so like with my dad for example when he would get up he went as he was sort of getting closer to the, what now I see back, I I can look back and go, wow, that was kind of getting closer to the end of his life. Um, my dad actually stayed very, very healthy and very well up until about two weeks before he passed. Like it happened very, very fast. So to give you a sense of it, he was down in Mexico with us like six weeks before his decline happened. And he navigated airports all on his own and came down and like, right. So he was to kind of give a perspective of it, but he, he would had trouble getting out of a chair. So he would, he would get himself up and he's like, whoa, and he would lose his balance when he was up into standing. So when I meet people like that, or I'm teaching people like that, I have them really think about the bottom of their feet and where those three points are in space and to just to stay in touch with those three points. And then as they're leaning forward to get out of the chair, for example, to really come back to those, their hips, their knees and their feet. Because if we're doing that inside the class and they've gained that awareness of that movement pattern inside the class, then I can bring their attention to that awareness pattern outside of class. And I find coming back to the feet really, really straightforward because no matter the footwear that someone has, they're they're going to be on their feet 
and they're going to be doing stairs or moving to uneven surfaces. So it's something to come back to consistently and it's their feet they want to stay on. Right. And so it's just a really simple coming back to, and as well, the breath piece of it as well, they can come back to it. The other piece that I like to bring people's attention to, and again, I do this very purposefully is whatever they had as an insight in the class, I have them come back to that insight. So if they became aware of, oh, interesting, I hold my jaw when I fill in the blank, or I grip in this area when I fill in the blank, it's like, okay, so then you then learned how to not do that when you're in the class. See if you can notice when that starts to show up outside of class. And then can you, again, like we did in class, can you do the movement without that happening? So then they're growing their own innate awareness, which can bubble over into their own proprioceptive awareness, their enteroception, which then helps the nervous system and helps the coordinated patterns, little, little tiny things that have a huge, huge impact. Oh, I really like this, that it's someone's own awareness. It doesn't matter what it is, something that they notice, then you you ask them to notice it at home. This is so good. You know, the last thing that someone wants is this big list of, you know, do five of these poses and like, this is going to take you a big chunk of time. Uh, anything else with, like you mentioned with your dad going from that sitting to standing, any other movements that we can practice? Like, I think that's a great one that sometimes we take for granted, but we can, we can really uh, bring that into a class. Are there any others? Well, the other two is walking on uneven surfaces. So you might be um, a person living in an urban center and depending on the, the weather systems that come through, that can have an impact on the way someone is able to move. The other is, um, again, urban center and they're having to cross a street And there's a lot of noise of vehicles and lights and a lot of distraction. That distraction element can can actually create too much sensory experience. And that can be a risk factor for falling. So sometimes what you can do in a class to sort of help bring someone's awareness to that is have them do two things at the same time. So maybe you can be like bee, bee buzzing breath or mantraing or doing something of that sort, plus doing a balanced thing. So doing one thing with one part of your brain and then with a body part, or even doing something with a bo- one part of what, one side of your body and then doing something with another side of your body, but getting, having more things happen at, a, at the same time to help them stay focused or train that focus. Because when they're in that urban environment and lots of things are going on around them, then they're able to keep that focus. And that, again, can be a risk factor that they can reduce. Then if you're an urban person that then goes out into a non-urban area and you're not used to working, like being on like trails or paths, then, then having to step over roots and things like that can be a bit tricky. So in a class, you can play around with um, standing on a block for example, and then stepping off of the block or stepping over the block or having two blocks on a mat and kind of navigating those blocks. There's also a common exercise in the physical therapy world called the star exercise. And so if you just kind of in your mind, visualize tape drawn on a floor. So not just a cross pattern, but like um, radiating stars where the tape is in a variety of different directions. And then you, you push your foot out one way and then you push your foot out another way. And then it's like, a, if you think about a clock, you push your foot out to one o'clock and then two o'clock and then three o'clock. And then, so you're moving your leg in, in a variety of different directions. And then you can also do that in with your eyes closed. So while that's not a specific like yoga in air quotes exercise, you can play around with that inside the class where um, maybe as a part of a balancing sequence, you're taking someone up into tree or you stepping them back into high lunge and then you bring them back to Tadasana and then take their foot out like directly to three o'clock wide or then maybe bring it out to two and then you lift the foot up and then bring it back. So different ways to challenge their brain and their movement and their proprioception uh, and then toss in a block or some other ball or something that they can step over and unstep 
unstep, is that a word? But step over and then step backward over and you just kind of play around with different orientations of props that they can um they can they can sort of navigate or train their navigation system. So when they're out in in arenas that they're not familiar with, with like roots and puddles and mud or softer surfaces, that they've got an ability to navigate those a bit more effectively. This is fantastic. You also mentioned closing the eyes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love that in my own practice. Like I feel like, okay, if I've got that balance, then I'll just try and close my eyes. And I'm often, you know, falling over, it gets challenging. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So why is that? Or, or, you know, are, are there any tips on adding that in or, or, um, you know, what about when students are also afraid to be fumbling and looking silly and falling over? Ah, brilliant. So that's a sort of, sort of a double question. So the first is, is that the visual system, we orient ourselves to the horizon. So when you take that out, now we are relying on our body sense and space and we're relying on our vestibular system and the, the information that's coming in through those arenas. So it's a great practice to, to practice with eyes closed or, or a blindfold if it's available for somebody. And I will walk students through things like that and having a wall close by or having a chair close by, and then just really tuning into their sense. Because once the vision starts to, when, when the vision's not there in terms of practice, like I said, you have to rely and train those other aspects. So you can do that in a safe environment in the class setting. And when people are nervous about fumbling, I just, I lead with humor. Like, all right, we're going to do something that's going to have you probably <laughs> fall all over the place. But I don't say, I mean, I'm careful with that language. Like if the, if the person's really concerned about falling, I likely won't do an exercise that's going to then make them fearful of falling. That would be a bit reckless. But if we're in a scenario where we are actually training and it's suitable for the group or the people in the, in the group, then it would be, yeah, like we're going to be falling all over the place possibly here. And that's sort of the point. So let's play around with, and yes, there might be some fumbling and, and then it becomes a bit easier. And what's great about that is then people can be less afraid of falling because one of the things is one thing to get shaky on your feet. And if you can write yourself, you're good, right? It's when you kind of go past that point and overturn, and then that's when you fall. So it's when you're in that, when you're in a studio setting or in a zoom setting, however you're running the classes And you can practice this, like having to write yourself, right. And catch yourself. If you, if you slip, then you, you gain confidence that, oh yeah, if I were to slip or if I were to lose balance, I don't actually hit the floor. Right. This just reminds me of a good friend of mine. Laura was leading a class many years ago and she put us all into tree pose and then she ran around us and said, I'm the wind. When I come near you, you need to blow over the tree. And I, I, we were all laughing so much at her being the wind. It made it fun. We were really flopping all over and uh, all of those things help, you know. It's, it's when we start taking smaller steps and having more fear in our steps and how we move that we start to lose it as well. Hey, Connected Yoga Teachers, I am popping in here to tell you about Offering Tree. Yes, they sponsor the podcast and that brings it to your ears right in this moment today. But I also use Offering Tree myself because they make everything run so smoothly and so automatically in my business. For example, I recently hosted a six-week online Yoga for Pelvic Health series And I just loved that the Zoom links went out in reminder emails. People were able to sign up online, pay online, fill out their forms and the terms and conditions. All of that was integrated and automatic. And then the main thing that got me really excited is that I could actually take that event, put it on my existing website. And if you don't have a website, not to worry, Offering Tree can help you with that. But I have an existing website. So I could take that event, put it on my existing site. And people who were going to my website could see my classes in their time zone. So let's say someone was going to my website and they lived on the West Coast of Canada or the United States, and they were in Pacific time they would see that that class begins at 6.30 a.m. for them 
it shows up in their time zone, even though it's 9.30 a.m. for me. That means that I do not have to do any time zone math, which is amazing, and neither do my students, so it really takes out that confusion of time zones. So if you want to focus more on teaching yoga and less on the tech side of things and less on time zone math, check out Offering Tree. Listeners get a special discount over at offeringtree.com slash Shannon. Now let's get back to our conversation with Susie today. Is there anything else that you can think of that you like to do for balance? Oh, one other thing that I like to do is I have a small, um, what's called a, like a balance cushion and, Mm -hmm. and I like to use those to stand on or, I mean, I like to use them in various ways, but when I pull those out or standing on a block, it can really kind of throw people off for a minute. And I think let's, let's, let's all do it together. Let's all look silly together wobbling around here. Yeah. Balance mats, um, wobble boards, bossy balls. Like those are all great tools to take you off of balance. You, um, you also mentioned something just a moment ago around, we take smaller steps. If you look really closely at older folks, there's a correlation between how they're walking, like when they're, they're getting into the shuffle phase and people at the end of a running race. So when you compare people who run really fast and they win the races, they usually are gazelles and they're fluid and they get through it. And it's like, but if you look at the people who are further in the pack and they're getting tired, you'll see their posture start to sort of start to slump. The springiness in their spine starts to become less springy. They don't move through hip flexion as well. They've lost rotation through their torso. Their knees are doing a little bit more of the work to get their feet through. So a lot of that movement dynamic is lost. And what you'll see as someone gets older, that same set set of factors can show up. And you'll see that, that same sort of the springy is less, like the springy spine is losing its spring and the feet start to shuffle, the hip, leg bones don't move as well on the hips. And I think sometimes people have this idea that this is just what happens as we get older and they're not wrong. But what I think the gap is, and my dad's a testament, was, was or is a testament to this, which is things can change in any age. That tissue can change. That ability to move better can absolutely change. You can regain a lot of springiness in your spine and that movement. You can gain regain a lot of that hip mobility and that ability to swing that leg through. There's a lot that can shift. The way we do it might be different than when we were in our 20s and our 30s, but so much change can happen. It's, it's why one of the programs I run, Your Age Doesn't Matter, is named that because my older clients would keep coming back to, you know, Susie, really, it's true. Your age doesn't matter. I'm like, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> and part of the, the key is that we aren't 20 or 30 anymore, that we, that those folks are 60 or 70 or 80 and things are different, but yet just because things are different doesn't mean your tissue can't change. It doesn't mean you can't regain balance. It can't, it, there's so much that's still available. Our systems are still so plastic that we can re- we can reduce the risk and we can just feel way more confident in our body and our brain. Yes. Oh, this is so good. I love that you're saying it doesn't matter about our age. It's really the mindset of, okay, I'm going to do these things and gain that back. I had a herniated disc. I don't know when that was now, sometime during COVID. <laughs> And I started, my physio was like, Shannon, you're starting to shuffle and you're starting to look down. So I was just, you know, my body was protecting and I was nervous to walk because it hurt so much at different times. And she got me to do some homework. You know, I want you to like kick your legs up while you're walking. And she got me to do it while she was watching on the treadmill so that she could cue it for me. It's like my body was forgetting. And I had no doubt that I could regain it back. But I think you're right. I think as we age, we think, well, this is just one of those things that goes and it doesn't need to be. That's, that's such an important message. Um, yeah. But here's, yeah, but here's the thing. Do you know why people believe that? Why? It's because people are told that. Right. And 
I recently turned 50 and all of a sudden I'm hearing all these messages out there about being old. Like, it's amazing. Like, it's like, well, you know, you don't want to hurt yourself when you're over 50. And I'm like, well, how did a year ago? I didn't hear any of this. Right. <laughs> that I'm hearing this now. But it's like when I was in school, so I was, I took my kinesiology degree uh, about 30 years ago and we learned about older folks and the research about older folks, guess where it was coming from? Where were most older folks, you know, 30, 40 years ago? I nursing mean, homes. Yes, nursing homes. So how functional are they? Right. Right. So we have to remember that a lot of the paradigm about being older is based off of research that was done on people or with people who were in scenarios that weren't highly functional. So when you, when you go to a physician, like the number of people who've told me, well, the physician, my doctor tells me, what do you expect? You're like, you're 65. Like, what do you expect? I'm like, what? Yeah, of, of course there's stuff happening. Of course, we're not like, we're, we have these physical structures that yes, there will be things that shift over time, of course. And what now is starting to happen is now there's better research coming out of like what's actually the reality these days of what it is to be older. And it's actually not what I learned. And that there's, and that's where we're starting to, the evidence, you know, the formal evidence is now catching up to say, yeah, there's actually a significant amount of change that can happen when we're older. And as that starts to get, you know, as that starts to dribble down, a lot of the thinking patterns, I think, will start to change. But there's definitely this feeding, there's a soup for people in there sort of definitely like I, I've, I've noticed in it plus 50 and definitely in the plus sixties and certainly in the seventies and the eighties of like, well, what do you expect? You are a blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay. And right. Right. <laughs> and so you're fighting a little bit, like there can be a bit of a fight against the machine, so to speak. And I see it all the time of, of people who are clearly showing that when you have the correct stimulus, all sorts of things can shift. So you can have osteoarthritis, you can have osteoporosis, you can have a lot of other age-related conditions. Those ne aren't necessarily skeletally going to change, but you can move and you can function way better with the right stimulus for sure. Right. Oh, this is so good. Thank you for sharing this. I'm thinking about I know people in their 90s that move like they are young people. So keep that in mind. Don't be afraid to challenge it. I'm even thinking of how my language changes around my parents. Like mm -hmm. my dad is almost 70 and he's working every single day. Like I was thinking, how are you keeping this up? Well, he does it every day. It's it's mm -hmm. his it's his routine. He he ha he he just doesn't doubt that his body can do it. <laughs> But it's curious that you're catching your own self yes, in that, you know, and, and, and amongst my family with my siblings, each of us were very different with my dad. Right. Right. And so I'm just kind of like, I, I was, I, you can guess where I kind of landed, but it was just, it's so, it's so, so interesting about just watch the unconscious bias <laughs> that starts to bubble up around, around being older. And yeah. what does that even mean? What's being older even mean? And, right. and what, what's even capable, what's possible and what is available for people who are plus 55, plus 60, plus 70, plus 80. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this story about your dad. And then all of this, I feel like it, it's going to be very helpful for our connected yoga teachers to listen to, uh, especially when that's one of the key things that yoga students will say, I, you know, mobility, flexibility, balance. Like those are, those are the things that people really want to focus on when they come to, to yoga. Is there anything else that you'd like to close out with, uh, as we work with students or as we work with our own balance? Remember the bottoms of your feet, however you want to cue them and connect to them, whether it's the four or the three or another way of touching the ground and feeling the ground and, just be conscious of those functional patterns and the coordinated patterns and your breathing patterns. And you'll notice that you can consistently improve those gains as you improve that proprioceptive and that interoceptive capacity. You'll see that the gains will be, um, will be made. 
And if our connected yoga teachers want to connect with you more, work with you, where do they find you? So my website is probably the best place where you can find me at functionalsynergy.com. And then we have our YouTube channel, which is at Susie.hately, which you can find me there. We've got a number of things around balance and other sequences that, that are there. And then we run a balance online balance training for yoga teachers and people who want to improve their balance a few times a year. So just let us know um, when you connect with us and we can give you information on how to find that. That's amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susie, for all of this information today. Also, thank you, dear listener, for being here and learning right along with me. One of my key takeaways here, because I love to teach one-on-one yoga, one of my key takeaways was when Susie talked about the importance of asking why our students want to improve their balance. And this would apply to so many things. Let's say a student comes in and they say, I want to sleep better. Really asking them why and kind of outlining what that would look like and the difference it would make in their life. I think that really helps everyone involved. It helps the yoga teacher remind someone if they've set this goal, I really want to improve my balance. It can help them when they get into that balance pose and it's a struggle or when they are hesitant to like fit in their quote unquote yoga homework. I would love to hear from you. What are your favorite poses or practices to improve balance? And What do you like to talk about with your yoga students around the topic of balance? You can connect with us in a few places. So if you go to our website, theconnectedyogateacher.com, there's a voicemail button there over on the right-hand side. You can leave us a voicemail. There's also a Facebook group, and you can find that right from our homepage as well or search for the Connected Yoga Teacher Facebook group. Or maybe you want to tag us in a social media post. So I'm at the Connected Yoga Teacher on Instagram. Oh my goodness, have any of you noticed that I like took a social media holiday from Instagram in the summer? I just really wanted to focus on being in my garden and being very present and I haven't gone back there yet. (laughs) I do check in on Instagram, but I am not posting to my stories like I used to. (laughs) I probably will go back, but gosh, it's been so nice to like really take in moments and not think about posting it. I want to give a shout out of thank you to Caroline. I hope I'm going to say this correctly, Caroline. Caroline Lichtenberg? Lichtenberg? (laughs) I'm sorry if I've messed up your last name. Caroline is from Germany and posted a really nice review in July of 2022 We had just done a series on cultural appropriation in June, and we dug into some really tough topics. And then Caroline left this review and said, Dear Shannon, you inspire me every Monday when I listen to your new episode. Thank you for the courage for the theme you are lately on. I think it's time to rethink our thoughts and patterns about other people, cultures, gender, and more. Yes, Now is the time, and you give me a new question to think about every Monday. Also, till next week, and stay strong and happy. Namaste. And then Caroline says in brackets, and I don't say this often, only when I feel it so. Also, namaste for you. Thank you so much, Caroline. I am going to make sure that we link to your website as well, so if anyone wants to check out Caroline in Germany, it's due in yoga.de. Now there are dashes between all of the words, I believe. I will look it up and we'll link to it in our show notes. Do dash in dash yoga.de. Thank you so much, Caroline, for listening to the podcast, for reaching out and for taking the time to leave a review. We love reviews. It helps other yoga teachers to find out about the podcast and we just really love it if we are supporting the work that you're doing. Also, I haven't made it to Germany yet, Caroline, but I would really like to because I have some family that was born in Germany, the Shilby side of my family, my grandpa's side of the family. And so someday, who knows, maybe we'll connect there. 
Alrighty, if you are looking for the notes, we take them for you, Connected Yoga Teachers. That's over at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 291. It's really cool how it works. There's clickable timestamps. You could go to our website, you could search for anything, and you'd come up with podcasts and articles and all kinds of things to support you. And if you want to hang out in real time, online, but in real time, here are some things that are coming up. So like I said, tomorrow, September 27th, 2022, I am hosting this Get Started as a New Yoga Teacher workshop. I'll make sure to link to that in the show notes, or you can head on over to offeringtree.com and look under their events. Another workshop I'm very excited about taking, being a student at and hosting, it's called Blurred Lines, The Harmful Intersection of Diet Culture and Yoga. It's a workshop with Jessica and Alyssa. Oh my gosh, Connected Yoga Teachers. It's basically like we don't know what we don't know as yoga teachers. And I used to say things <laughs> as a newer yoga teacher, and I used to say cues and my language and probably my marketing and my, you know, the posters that I made and everything. There was a lot in all of that that I didn't know was harmful. So Jessica and Alyssa are yoga teachers, but they're also registered dietitians and they're educated in disordered eating. This workshop honestly is a must for all yoga teachers because diet culture is very ingrained in the wellness industry. We need to be able to notice where it is so that we're not doing it. (laughs) We need to know what it looks like, which I didn't know for years. And also we need to make sure it's kind of scrubbed out of our profession. It is a profession that we have as yoga teachers and there's some outdated information out there. There's some harmful information out there and we really will get also into this topic of scope of practice. So please join me for that workshop. And also we are going to have them on the podcast. So if you feel like, I just can't sign up for something right now, We will be having Jessica and Alyssa on the podcast, and that's next week, which is really cool. So make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast so you don't miss that. Okay, lastly, the events that I want to tell you about are all over inside of Pelvic Health Professionals. This is a place to hang out if you're teaching to people who have a pelvis, which is really everyone. Now that's my that's my view on things because I just geek right out about all things pelvis and pelvic health. But if you are interested in learning more, here's what's happening. My six-week Yoga for Pelvic Health series is now available on demand. So you can sign up for it. The replays are all there for you. We talk about breath, hip pain, pelvic floor, bladder, bowel, and uterus health. Our members have been telling us, wow, they learned a lot of the theory about pelvic health, but this was the missing piece, seeing how an actual class could be put together when it's focused on pelvic health. September 26th, which is today if you're listening in real time, we have a member collaboration call. That is where our members get together and they talk about the work that they're doing and they hear about the work that other pelvic health professionals are doing and they look at how they can work together and collaborate and support each other. October are two really cool things. We have a pelvic floor hypertension talk with Dr. Sarah Reardon. We're going to talk about what happens when the pelvic floor is holding too much tension. Then on the 24th of October, I'm leading a three and a half hour yoga for pelvic health training. This goes along so well with the six week series. Shout out to Angela because she asked the question. She's like, if you had to pile in all like the basic information, what would that be? And that's where this three and a half hour workshop came in. In November, Libby Hinesley is coming in to talk with us about hypermobility and pelvic health. And then in December, we're going to be talking about yoga for menopause. I'll be telling you more about that as well because we we are bringing that guest expert on the podcast also, which I love when those things work together so well. So if you're thinking, okay, how do I access this? You go to one place and you can sign up for the membership and get access to all of this. Pelvichealthprofessionals.com is where to go. 
and you can sign up for a monthly membership. You can sign up for the annual membership. Let me know if you have any questions. Next week on the podcast, Jessica Grossman and Alyssa Toomey are going to be talking to us about taking diet culture out of yoga. Oh my gosh, this is needed. You know, look at a yoga website, look at a magazine article, and just ask yourself how many times is there a focus on body image or food in some way? And why the heck is it here? (laughs) That is what we're going to talk about next week. I cannot wait for that episode to come out. And we have another one following up, but I can't get too far ahead myself. Some really exciting things coming up on the podcast. Thank you so much for being here and learning from Susie about how we can help ourselves and our students with balance. I'm really excited to see you take this out into the classes that you're teaching and and see how you use this in your own practice as well. Our amazing team over here makes this possible. Our audio engineer is Suzanne. Our traveling writer is Crunch. And the community support manager and really the glue that keeps this ship together sometimes is Sinead. Alrighty, connected yoga teachers, I want to know what will you be doing this week to stay connected to yourself, your yoga practice, and to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up. <laughs>